Welcome to History Hack. If you didn't know by now, we are the revolution. That means we're sharp, witty, lots of fun, but it also means that we're essentially the peasants in Les Mis huddled round a table in the corner of the bar with no money. If you enjoy the show, please do support us. We have a Patreon account by which you can donate a small monthly sum in appreciation of what you're hearing. Alternatively, we have Ko-fi in which you can just do a one-off donation as a thank you if you particularly enjoy a certain episode. Either way, we massively appreciate all of your support. Hope you enjoy the show. Hello and welcome to another episode of History Hack. I'm with Lockie again today, but Lockie, <laughs> we, are, we are way out of our wheelhouse today, aren't we? Well, com- completely, yeah. I mean, I'm... Um just looking at the brief for this and and we're talking about a roman guy called maximus so i'm thinking Haha, I, I know about this. This, no I'm, I'm, I'm no i don't actually at all we maxwell craven's with us uh, uh he's a historian who's written extensively on, on interesting things like architecture and antiques uh for the georgian group journal uh, country life amongst others he's written several books including uh, secret derby uh, and published the imperial families of ancient rome and is here to talk to us about his new book magnus maximus the neglected roman emperor and his british legacy and i'm i really enjoy this because actually some of my favorite stuff i think some people will know i guide in the british museum and and there's some excellent um, roman britain stuff in there so i want to hear more about it hello maxwell how are you i'm fine thank you very much nice to see you so i being roman britain I think we need to talk about the Roman Empire in, in fairly broad terms, if we can, and, and what Roman Britain means uh, at this time. We're talking about the late 4th century we're talking about? Oh, certainly, yes. Well, the thing is, at this period, you might everything in the empire was going fairly well until in 378, the Emperor of the Lens, who was ruling the east half of the empire, got completely pasted by a huge amount number of Goths who'd basically been upset by maladministration in their efforts to settle across the Danube. And uh, he got himself killed. And it's the first time this has happened since AD 8 when, um, or AD 9, when the Publius Quinctilius Varus had lost three of Augustus's legions. Uh, and oh, himself. Bring back my legions. Yeah. It, it was a total disaster, utterly out of the blue. And um, I think a certain amount of uh, 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 chaos descended because the western half of the empire was ruled by um, what one of, of the scholars of the of periods have said, uh, a dilettante youth and a child. Um, so basically you had a sort of a, a Valentinian II who was just a kid and Gratian who was in his teens but was rather bookish and religious. Uh, so in the west the reaction to this disaster was probably an outbreak of chaos apart from the fact that the chaos in the East, um, after all, the only emperor who was any good, Valens had been killed, um, and a group of generals had to suddenly get together and find someone to succeed him to stable the ship. And uh, that in itself was um, a, a fairly tense time. And it, one gets the impression that although Britain had been very stable in the third century, there's a great period for building uh, villas and stuff like that. And uh, there's no, there have been difficulties. There'd been a great rebellion in 367, allegedly, um, which had been put down. Um, it seems likely that the local, that the people who liked taking, taking a bit of booty from the British uh, <laughs> policy, like the, uh, the Scots and the, the Picts and the Scots, as they were called, um, probably decided to make a massive raid. So the outcome, I think, was um, that uh, Theodosius I, who was the uh, a senior general who was called out from retirement um, to take over the empire in the east, um, <clears throat> we, we, I think that his, his relation, Magnus Maximus, a fellow Spaniard, was sent straight to Britain to sort things out, uh, which is not quite the... Um, take that the cont- summer contemporary sources make on it because basically he ended as a total he himself ended up dead uh, and of course the um, there was a lot of negative publicity about him afterwards so it's very difficult to sort the wheat from the chaff so in a nutshell that was the situation at the beginning of the saga so not remotely complicated then no no not at all. <laughs> Total chaos yeah <laughs> I love it I love this later Roman stuff because it's just it's just complete mess uh, and it's entertaining 
for us. So who is Magnus Maximus and how does he come to prominence? Well, he was clearly a relation of a fairly close relation of Theodosius the, the first who took over in 378 after this disaster. We don't know quite what his relationship was, but it's probably through um, through a female. In other words, somebody's wife was his auntie, auntie or something like that. But because the most of the sources have been um, uh, subsequently sterilized, it's a bit difficult. But even once Sir Magnus Maximus was dead in 388, um, one of the senators, Pacatus, gave a, a panegyric to the new emperor Theodosius, who vanquished him, and even he admits that they were he was a he was a, a relation. Although he tries to play it down so hard, it's obvious that he was quite a close relation. The both families came from Spain; they were both fairly well to do, and they both served as soldiers in arms uh, together as 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 young people. Um, they we think they fought together on the Rhine frontier. In 367, there was a massive barbarian revolt in Britain, uh, and probably accompanied by uh, a chap called Valentine trying to grab grab the throne for himself in the aftermath. And um, the Theodosius's father, who was also called Theodosius, was actually put in charge of stamping all this out. And the, the son Theodosius, the younger, and his young cousin, we think Maximus, they we know they fought together in Britain putting this revolt down, and after it was put down, um, they went on to, 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 to other things, almost certainly together. Um, the first thing they did after, we'd hear about after the revolt in Britain had been um, put down and sorted out, although of course it is possible the revolt was uh, over-egged considerably by the historian Ammianus Marcellinus, who was desperate to um, celebrate the uh, the, the, the wonderful nature of uh, Theodosius the Elder. Um, it may not have been as bad a revolt as it seems. But they made it sound one, but they went on to fight uh, to to fight in Africa together uh, and to put down another revolt led by an African chieftain called Firmus, who declared himself emperor, and uh, they had to put that down as well. Um, so they were they were brothers in arms, and. Uh, after this incident in Africa, the father, Theodosius the Elder, who was who went to who went to Africa to sort it out, and the two lads went with him, he was he was murdered on uh, ju just at the time that um, Valentinian the First, who was Valens, the man who died at age, uh, in in three seventy eight, his elder brother was then ruling the, the West, and he seems to have had Theodosius the Elder killed. Uh, and the other two drop off the record for a while at that stage. And we think they probably, we know that Theodosius the Younger went to, into retirement and Maximus may have done as well. So um, that's who he was at that extent. We get, otherwise, I've tried to challenge facts that um, uh, have, have long been set in stone. Um, it's always said he came to the throne in 383. Um, I've argued that he was sent directly to Britain in 378 or 379 to sort out chaos. He is well recorded as having put down a, uh, an uprising um, uh, very successfully. And um, a recent scholar has re-examined something called the Chronicle of 452 to re look again at the dating implied in it, which is very convoluted. And uh, I've argued that he may well have come to the throne in Britain about 380 or 381, about the time he'd got this great victory. And he didn't actually cross to the continent and go particularly public about it till 383. So that's a new take on his early on the early part of his his career as emperor. And uh, we hope that I hope I've been convincing convincing convinced him convincing about it, and he issued coins from the London Mint, which is what emperors did when they were on the, on the spot, and uh, we think that they, they may be redatable to 381 or a bit earlier than his official reign started as well. So um, it, you know, we had a big rethink about his, uh, his the beginning of his career as emperor, put it that way. This, uh, just for context, and, and forgive, I'm going to sort of divert often a little bit and, and and start tangenting as I often do but just for context like, was was Magnus a, a, a fighter first and a, and a political man second or yeah, um, I, think, um, I think he was he was always a career soldier um I think the outcome of his becoming emperor what did he did does tell us one thing that 
he was generally reckoned by the sources that came shortly afterwards that he, he actually did a very good job as emperor and, and um, stabilized the West very successfully, administered it very successfully, and didn't make any serious mistakes. I mean, you might argue the only mistakes he really made was to have the, his rival, the Emperor Gratian, killed, uh, which I think was probably done by his barbarian chief of staff, who was called Andrew Gathus, uh, in a desperate effort to please his master. Uh, I've always, I well, have the suspicion that he was intending to send young Gratian back to back to to Constantinople to to the um, to the clutches of Theodosius to deal with, um, but it all went pear shaped at the at the moment that when. Um, Maximus had beaten Gratian's forces in the field outside Paris. Um, the other thing was that uh, he 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 is the first emperor ever to have executed um, a heretic. It's a very oh. common story. So then, this is this is Christian he he heresy. Was heavily involved with the church, as all yeah. at that time were. But he did a pretty good job. But basically, uh, there was a, a renegade bishop who believed all sorts of naughty things. I couldn't possibly say in a public. Um, public podcast but um well, we have done probably but um, yeah history uh, hack is renowned <laughs> for not caring about propriety so please rabbit hole away because i really want to know now well, I, I think um what his variant on christ he was an, a spanish bishop but i think his variant on christianity involved a certain amount of um uh, intimacy between converts um uh, but whatever he was accused of, which may have been exaggerated, but he went. This... Nothing sells your religion like come join an orgy, does it? <laughs> it was a bit like that. But this chap who, who, um, who was called Priscillian, um, he was a bishop, and he he eventually applied appealed to the Pope to resolve the issues about him being locked out of the church generally, and the popes didn't want anything to do with him. And then he went to the Bishop of Milan, St. Ambrose, and he didn't want anything to do with it. So the Max, Magnus Maximus said, well, uh, I will deal with it. It's a civil matter if the church won't deal with it. So he dealt with it as a civil matter. And his there, were, there was an awful lot of, the whole saga is, it, it's very contemporary in its complexity and name calling, but in the end, his, Praetorian prefect, who was the chief civil official at Trier, where his capital was, basically condemned this chap to be executed, and he was duly executed. So then the church said, oh, you shouldn't be doing this, like executing bishops, it's our responsibility. So he said to them, well, you didn't, you, you turned him away, so what do you expect me to do? We can't run the empire with people like that, leg overing all over the converts of Spain, it's just not on. So that was the end of that. Um, but that was those are the only two things that, that people uh, attribute him as actual mistakes. I, Interesting. I, it's, I mean, it's, it sounds to me like a very practical uh, sort of man. And if, if the understanding is that he's done a, a reasonably good job, but he was a soldier in the past, is there any, is there any more to his reign as emperor than sort of trying to trying to I feel like maybe um if there's rebellions going off every every couple of years then he might be a bit bit of a well, firefighter the one good thing was that there were no rebellions under his regime or his um cousin Theodosius regime uh, things went pretty quiet um what 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 I've contended the greatest contribution he made to the peace of the empire and to Roman Britain was that he he had got to know the tribe the british tribes on the um periphery of the um, of britain in that is southern scotland um western britain what is wales cornwall and possibly in ireland and he got to know them after this rebellion when he was a young a fairly young officer in 367 and what i suggested was that in 380 or thereafter he went round and made bound them to the empire by formal treaty gave them sort of, a sort of independence a sort of, it, under the supervision of an, a, probably an appointed prefect, just to keep an eye on things, and said, you do, we'll give you a subsidy to look after your piece of Britain, keep all the Picts and Scots out, and uh, we'll, we'll just leave you alone. And they'd, he'd been involved already in Africa 10 years earlier in settling the tribes on the edge of the Sahara in exactly the same way. And St. Jerome tells us 30 years later that they, they had been settled ever since and hadn't given any problems. And this arrangement he made in Britain seems to have been the, the, sown the seeds of his later career as a, as a mythological hero in British, 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 British stories um, and why his name crops up a lot 
in post-Roman literature. But this settlement was something he, he, he was really quite important achievement on his part. Um, it, it's long been suspected, but I mean, I've just tried to, to, to give chapter and verse. And I spent, some, you know, I've devoted a chapter to each part of Britain uh, and explain why I think he was involved. Um, because he's got this, um, he's got this terrific resonance in what was left of the Celtic part of Britain. So there you are. Okay. We're going to get on to that in a bit. But before we do, you describe a long fifth century. What, what do you mean by that? Well, I, I rather, I'm afraid to pinch that expression a bit from the Georgian group who always talk about the long 18th century from 1688 to 1837. Yeah, I have a running gag with Dan Snow every time he mentions his precious long 18th century. Oh, right. like, oh, no one cares. Uh, obviously, people <laughs> do care. Uh, but yeah, so there's a Roman equivalent. Yeah, well, it, I think it is, yes, because from the, from the moment um, Magnus Maximus left Britain and, find, and then was deposed, there is a period from, say, 388 to sometime in the beginning, early in the 6th century, where Roman Britain very slowly run down, ran down. And um, a lot happened that we don't know much about, but we've only got archaeology and things like that to help us with, and a lot of written sources, which all of which can be called into question. Um, what I, I've tried to describe in my sixth chapter, which really links Magnus Maximus the man to Magnus Maximus the myth, that what I think happened in that period, which he actually attempts to explain a lot as to why it all came about, I mean, I tried to suggest that, unlike some commentators who think that when the Romans left, that the currency collapsed immediately and that life went, collapsed back into an Iron Age existence, I basically said this it cannot possibly be likely. You've only got to look at modern countries where there's been a, a, a modest collapse or a lapse of central authority. This does not usually happen uh, in a sophisticated society. So um, the whole thing is, um, I've tried to set out how the we, using a quote um, that Britain was taken over by tyrants at the time, mean uh, and the Latin word for tyrants, tyranny, means usurping emperors. Basically, I basically said that you know a, a succession of blokes came along and tried to ruin, rule in the Roman fashion, not knowing that they were going to be completely separated from the empire ever, ever from that moment onwards ever. Uh, and they kept things on an even keel, and they managed to do it on and off with daring degrees of success right through till the beginning of the sixth century, by which time things were beginning to fall apart rather rapidly. And I also looked at the archaeology of life in Britain at the time, and there are things recently discovered, like the, um, the mosaic pavement found at Chedworth in Room 28, uh, which isn't, cannot been laid, have been laid down before about 425 AD and probably later. And because of that, uh, the, the one of the, our leading experts in mosaics, he said, well, a lot of other mosaics, which are basically clearly by the same school of mosaic makers, are also that late. So there were, there were people in places like the Cotswolds living in, in, continuing to live the Roman life long after everybody else that was taught in their school days, that we'd all gone back to living in hill forts uh, and waving spears around. Um, and I think the same is true if you look at the uh, other aspects of rural life and urban life and church life. Things were bumping along and also recent studies um, have shown that the currency, was it, what, they weren't getting any newly minted coins in, but they were using the old ones, the wear of the coins. And the, some recent hordes have shown that there was coin being circulated other than just being used as bullion uh, and fairly well into the fifth century um, before things became went down to being uh, more, more in terms of barter. So the whole thing's very complicated, but I've tried to review the whole of this long period so that you, you come out of it um, with a fairly clear idea of what was left when the middle started to crumble, which was basically all these little principalities around the outside um, run by people who thought they were descended from Magnus Maximus. So, That's really interesting. I mean, because I'm... Like I say, I've spent quite a bit of time working in the in the British Museum, but I'm also, also from Suffolk. And um, <laughs> when I think, because I, I remember quite vividly the Hoxton Horde being uh, discovered in 92. Oh, yeah. 
1992, I think it was. And, yeah. and, and you, we've also got like the things like the Milden, Milden Hall treasure. And there's various other things around East Anglia where you just think, right, well, everyone just seems to pack up in the in the early 5th century and clear off. But that's clearly not the case for much of the rest of the country. I suppose if, you, if you, you've you got the immediacy of being in East Anglia and, and a few hundred hairy Germans suddenly coming towards your villa, you're going to bury your stuff and run. But that's not necessarily true around the rest of the country. Yeah, I mean, each time a hoard like that was buried, there was some some individual circumstances which we can't we really don't know. Uh, and um, th th those two are East Ang famous East Anglia ones. They're very late, also the stuff in them is very late. Um, but these are parts of England where there was um, Germanic peoples are being settled fairly early on, and it may be these people put put them in the soil, uh, expecting to come back and just didn't which is fair enough. Um, but I, I've actually discussed this a bit in the, the long fifth century, is that we have all these tales about uh, Hengist being settled in Kent. Uh, and it, this is a very normal Roman thing to do, is to get some a group of, of um, out, people from outside the emperor, barbarians as they called them, to basically do the fighting for them. And in return, you gave them uh, sustenance and settled them on land. There was clearly depopulation in Britain at the time. and Kent was clearly uh, settled fairly early on. Uh, East Anglia, but the archaeology, laced archaeology from East Anglia was suggesting that there were there was a lot of intermixing of people um, and they were settling there, I'm sure. And I've suggested it was all done by treaty, organized by whoever was in charge of Britain after 409 AD uh, in the typical Roman way. And in exchange, they got paid a nona, which are, is provisions. Um, which is a typical Roman way of rewarding them. Where it all went pear-shaped and resulted in something called the Saxon Revolt of uh, 443 or thereabouts, I think I have suggested was due to a climate crisis, which is well recorded, a climate anomaly, which completely wrecked the, um, the harvests. And it, the, the central authority was unable to send the supplies to keep the keep the lads in, in Kent and possibly East Essex and Suffolk happy. Uh, so there was a revolt. Uh, and that was one of the time, the first time that the, the, the established order had really been seriously threatened. And it was obviously very serious, but eventually it was clawed back. There's yeah. nothing quite like hunger to get people rioting, is oh, there? Yes, absolutely. <laughs> Just on sources, then. I mean, archaeology is 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 clearly very important indeed. What are, what are some of your best sources of of this period? Do try and take us through because I'm fascinated by it. Well, the first of all, there's the written sources. The first source we get, which is the most contemporary of all, because Ammianus Marcellinus, who records the all everything up to about 375, uh, suddenly stops writing, although he lived a bit longer. So we can't rely, and he's the best, the most reliable historian for the period from way back. Um, but he's, there are successor historians, um, Zosimus, Rosius, Sosimund. Um, the letters of Sam, St. Ambrose are helpful because he was writing to the court of Magnus Maximus. Um, St. Jerome, who writes about things relevant. And there are later sources like Gregory of Tours, who wrote in the sixth century, who was quoting people from earlier on. And um, you've just got to go through those and try and work out uh, what their bias, biases were uh, and uh, try and derive something from them. And then there was this wonderful speech by this chap called Pacatus in the Senate uh, to welcoming Theodosius after he'd put Maximus down and saying what a wonderful fellow he was. And all the things he says about, about Maximus are all derogatory, but they're, they're, some of them are, are very informative, which is quite useful. And then you've got the problem of all the sources in Britain. <laughs> Um, oh, and uh, the, the other sources for the Roman period of, of um, poor old Maximus is there are inscriptions which are uh, very useful. Um, there are all sorts of other things. There's numismatic evidence. Uh, there's quite a lot to go on. It's just a matter of coordinating it all and trying to interpret it. And it, it, when it comes to what was happening in Britain, all the literature is later and very dubious. Uh, you've got the famous Gildas who was writing in the early sixth century. And he's not writing history. He's, he's saying, saying to the British, you're a, an absolute load of bastards. You've thrown away your entire way of life by being dissolute and horrible. Um, and then uses a lot of history to explain why. Uh, and he, 
it's only partly reliable, which is a bit of a nuisance. There's a Constantius's life of St. Germanus who came to Britain in the 420s and the 430s, which tells us quite a lot of interesting things. There's a, there's a dubious life of St. Germanus embedded in something called the Historia Britonum, written, which is often called Nennius in the eighth century, uh, which adds something, um, and, and some things which are good and some things which are frankly unbelievable. Um, there's Bede, the venerable Bede, or the venomous Bede, as uh, he used to be called by the two famous earlier historians, and um, the Anglo-Saxon Chronicle. So all the, none of them are reliable for this period. Uh, and you've got the pedigrees, which are held in various uh, collections, which describe by basically from genealogies derived from king lists, which uh, purport to say what was going on in some of these frontier states, as um, the Romans would have called them. And then after that, you get Geoffrey of Monmouth's History of the Kings of Britain, which is nobody believes a word of except Recently, some people like Miles Russell have established that some of the things he says about what was happening about the time that Julius Caesar came, uh, that seems to be um, nuggets of provable fact in it. So uh, you, you have to worry about him. But as it is, no, nobody, least of all me, takes him at face value at all. And after that, there's the Welsh stories called the Mabinogion, which are basically very nice romances, very enjoyable. And one of them is all about Magnus Maximus. Uh, why did they write a, a wonderful romance about how Magnus Magnus, Ma Mag Mag Magnus Maximus cross Europe um, by astral travel or something very similar uh, in order to win the hand of a lovely lady who happened to live in Carnarvon? Um, you know, <laughs> you have to ask yourself what are all these? What do all these things mean? And that was that, that was the ridiculously stupid. So, stiff task that I set myself and uh, whether I answered it I don't know but I mean I, I've devoted a bit of time in the Roman section about uh, Magnus Maximus about Carnarvon because it does have resonance with him um, but whether the, the memory of it lingered till the 11th or 12th centuries I don't know but uh, I rather suspect it somehow did. So, yeah. It's not quite as depressing as I thought it was in terms of sources, Lockie. I mean, obviously, we're 20th century historians. We are so spoilt rotten, it's unbelievable. But it's not as bad as I thought it was. No, no, it's not, it's not as bad as you think <laughs> it is, but the, it's got more pitfalls in it than you thought. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. You almost, almost wonder if a, if a story like, um, oh, I don't know, it ends up being Havelock the Dane and then goes on to become a Hamlet later on, and then it's the yeah, Lion yes. King, and it's... it's... Yeah. <laughs> I don't think any of these ones have got made it that far <laughs> to, to become the Mabinogion. It really sort of that was it. Um, okay, then... you've already alluded to the fact uh, Maximus. So he's considered a bit of a founding father of several Roman polities, isn't he? Yeah, oh, yeah, absolutely. Yes, I mean, uh, he, he's. Um, you can look at him. Well, the people who were ruling places like um, northeast Scotland, Galloway, Isle of Man. Domitia, that is what is modern Pembrokeshire and Carmarthen, Powys, possibly much of North Wales and possibly Dumnonia, all have claims to Magnus Maximus in various legendary sources. Um, and these all derive, really, from people who were supposed to be sons of him, uh, which really is a very strange concept, because if they were his, if he had that many sons, he must have been a very busy man. Yeah, so that's one of the one of the terms that we have here, isn't it? Who, who are the sons of Maximus? Yeah, well, uh, first of all, he had a real Roman a son in, whose existence is well attested in Roman history, which who was called Victor, who was his co-emperor and was probably a teenager, and he left him in Tria when he when he moved to Italy to dislodge Valentinian II. He left him there as as the ruler. Uh, under the tutelage of a couple of um, a couple of generals, one of whom I suspect was totally incompetent, but that's a detail. Um, so he had a real son, we know that, but uh, all of these dynasties um, claim to have been founded by another son. Um, in fact, I can count six of them. Uh, there was one called called Dimit, who was founded founded the kingdom of Domitia. Uh, he's actually an Irishman who had been settled there, probably by, under Magnus Maximus, to protect the underpopulated southwest corner of Wales. Um, he came from a tribe, uh, a, a group of Irish um, uh, families who uh, had fallen out with the 
with their local king and had uh, were sort of living a, a wandering life until they were transplanted by 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 Maximus, who clearly had very strong connections in Ireland. Um, and uh, his dynasty, it, it starts off with a couple of Irish people, you can say it, it pretty sure existed. Then they put Maximus in, then they give him a son called Dimit, which is just to explain the name of the kingdom. And then it eventually comes to some names like Agricola, and er, who's called, or in Welsh, Erco, who is um, a, a, a real person who we actually know existed. And then there's another one called Ant Anton or Antonius, who was um, founded a dynasty in the north. One called Owen Findu or Eugene, Eugene Blacklips, who also founded a dynasty in the north. Um, and there's another one called Donatus or Donat, who founded the dynasty in Galloway and who and uh, uh, probably um, renewed the dynasty of uh, Strathclyde. And another one called Edmibed, which who doesn't have a, a Welsh um, a Roman name. Who had a dynasty in the north, and then that man called. And there's two Irish pedigrees in in one of the Irish collections who give him a son called Leo, about which nobody knows anything except he left a, left a lot of Irish descendants. So you have to think, who the hell were these people, and why were they connected up? And my what I've tried to say is that when he was settling the frontiers in the 380s, he sent he, each one of the, the head man of each of these groups was given uh, um, a status. They signed a treaty, they got a subsidy, they probably were given a prefect to look after them. And this man, his, his descendants, when they became more literary, turned what was a list of local rulers, starting with Maximus, who'd set the whole thing up, and grafted them onto the family trees. And in fact, I think you can look at the names I've gone through and you can reduce them to four pretty easily, of which the most interesting is the one called Owen Blacklips, because um, he is the one. Uh, who I think was is probably the name of the person who took over Britain in 409 when the officials of Constantine III were thrown out um, because he keeps cropping up in all sorts of places. Um, and he, the dynasty he left is non-existent, which is typical of people who are associated with the middle of Britain at this period. You don't, you, you don't find any genuine pedigrees relating to people like Ambrosius or Elianus or King Arthur or anybody like that. Probably because if they did exist, which I'm sure some of them did, they were in the middle part of England. And as catastrophe overcame that and, and the Germanic dynasties emerged from the wreckage in the sixth century, the records all just went up the spout. So there was no legendary background for them to, to get welded onto um, di British dynasties in the, uh, in, the, in the edges of the country. But uh, he, he's quite an interesting one. I think the one called Ant Antonius is the same as the one called Donatus. I think they were the same man. And they founded a dynasty that ruled Galloway as well as Strathclyde. And uh, one of them broke away and ruled in the Isle of Man. And the man and the heir and the king of the Isle of Man married the heiress of the kingdom of Gwyneth and much later on. And um, so the kings of Gwyneth right down to the well in the last, I think, probably claim to be descendants of Magnus Magnus. Magnus Maximus. So uh, you know these sons of Maximus, they, they were they were everywhere. Um, there were a lot of them. Um, and the thing is, I we don't think for a moment they existed, but they were people associated with the founding of the Celtic polities that um, ringed ringed central Britain, and uh, which basically survived. Um, a long time. Um, you know, the last surviving one of them was snuffed out in 1282. It was the last unconquered part of the Western Empire uh, when uh, Edward I finally conquered Wales. That's such an interesting way of looking at it. I, I wouldn't ever have considered Edward I campaigning to be um, the last, kicking the last vestiges of Roman Britain out. Yeah. Is it, I mean, this drive... West, I mean, the Western North, I, I, that's that's just a, a, a kind of result of the Germanic invasions. And uh, Maximus had, did he have any particular links to Wales beyond, you know, his, what what we term his sons? Well, he, what, one thing I, I attribute, which I do attribute to him, uh, which is sometimes attributed to, to um, Theodosius the Elder uh, after the barbarian uprising of 367, but I think it's probably the work of Maximus, is the total reorganization of the Welsh 
coast, coastal defences because they were suffering from incursions of Irish. Uh, there's plenty of archaeological proof of that as well. And he refortified Sigontium, Carnarvon, uh, built a, a, an ex a, a separate fort not far away from the, the one that the main fort at, at there, uh, called Hen, which survives quite to, to a considerable size, at a place called Hen Walio. There's a, there's a place called Dinas Dentley um, on the coast further away, where there's a, almost certainly a watchtower or possibly a lighthouse. Uh, he re reinforced Hollyhead at Car Giddy. Uh, and there were other signal stations believed to have been put up around the North Wales coast, which have eroded away or otherwise vanished. The refortification of the Roke Saxon Shore type fort at Cardiff may well have been his work. So he strengthened Wales at, on the edge. And in the middle of Wales, all the forts that had been there from the conquest onwards were vacated. So presumably having struck deals with various um, tribal leaders in the, what is now Wales, he didn't need to police the middle of Wales anymore, so he could take the troops away and, if necessary, use, use them in other th theatres. But he did strengthen the coasts of Wales in the same way that 100 years earlier they'd strengthened the coasts of um, Norfolk, Suffolk, Essex, Kent, Sussex, uh, with the Saxon shore forts. So I think that's that's one, one of his connections with Wales. And the other great connection with Wales, of course, is if you go to Llangothlan and look at the Pillar of Eliseg, which is un, an un, what looks like a Roman pillar, but is believed to be post-Roman, but is big and impressive and was clearly made by somebody who knew something about classical architecture um, and was originally a standing cross. And it had a big inscription on it, um, basically outlining the glories of the princes of Bois. And amongst it um, is the statement that Magnus Maximus had a daughter called Severa, which is a perfectly reasonable name for her, uh, who married Vortigern, the famous Vortigern, and that their children were the kings of Poes and various other minor principalities. And one of them was St. Faustus, who was uh, a, 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 a bishop in Gaul and a great friend of Sidonius Apollinaris. Um, it's a, Say it's so unlikely, but there it is. It's one of the earliest pieces of of the, of the evidence, really, because the pillar was set up in the in the eighth century rather than in the ninth, and um, it predates the Historia Britonum by a little bit. So it's quite quite an interesting source. And if that that alliance took place, it means that Magnus Maximus um, had some kind of input into the founding of Poes, which probably began in a, as uh, with Roxeter as a nucleus. And uh, there are other ones like it. Uh, you know, there's a there's a there's a notional daughter of Magnus Maximus, who, or possibly somebody else uh, uh, of a Roman emperor, who marries into the into the dynasty ruling Dumnonia of Devon and Cornwall. Um, so they were they were everywhere. These allusions, but his links to Wales were chiefly through this connection with uh, uh, with refortifying the Welsh coast. And of course, in the Mabinogion, this wonderful story in the 12th century. Um, he Carnarvon is where it all happens. He where, where he goes to seek this bride, and then sallies forth therefrom for further adventures, which includes the retaking of Rome itself. So uh, you know it's a he's uh, and a lot of this legendary material all ended up in Wales anyway, because with the fall of the northern kingdoms uh, gradually uh, until only Strathclyde was left, um, all the literature seems to have found its way to Wales, which is how it survived. Um, which is rather fine. And then there was the thing about North Wales. North Wales is always said to have been founded by a man called Cuneva, uh, who was a Votadinian prince. That is to say, he came from North e the Northeast Scottish Lowlands. Um, his capital was Edinburgh, Tyre Eden. Um, John Cock has proved, I think, very conclusively that he never went to Wales at all. But the Welsh dynasty of Gwynedd claimed descent from him. Uh, and he's alleged to have had all these sons and all these sons who must have lived in the early fifth century, if not a bit earlier, uh, one, two, three, how many, I've just refreshed my memory, eight of them, um, all but one, uh, all but two have got Roman names. Um, Tibayan, Osvile, Ruvan, Dunod, Keretic, Anion, Dogvile, Aidan. There were probably Tiberianus, Ishmael, Romanus, Donatus, Anianus Iternalis, 
they were probably Roman officers sent up to get the Irish out of the North, North Wales area. And they found mm. dynasties. And one of them had a grandson called Miriam, probably Marin, Marinianus, uh, who gave, and that's some, they nearly all gave their names to parts of Wales or counties, which have all been subsequently abolished. And uh, that's another connection because I suspect that it's either under Maximus's settlement or continuations of it that they were sent up there and they somehow managed to put down roots and never got away again. They thought they went native. Does it, does it seem like his strength and his ability to manage his empire is, is almost, uh, I'm sort of seeking other parallels in history now, I'm almost thinking Alexander after his death, his empire then breaks up and, and, and the great Assyrian empire of Ashur and Nepal breaks up after his death. Is there something kind of parallel in that? Is there a real strength that then is, is unmaintainable thereafter? Well, I'm not sure because all, all the people who broke Alexander's empire up thought they were all as good as he was. So they decided they're all entitled to a bit of the action, whereas all these chaps are quite happy in their own little native areas, being a king of their own little castles and doing a really good job. Uh, they didn't have any, any. I don't, there's no sign of them wanting to, to replace him. Um, you know, when he fell, he was replaced by another Roman emperor, basically. Um, yeah. So it, I don't think it's the same sort of thing at all. Um, he did a good job in Britain, I think. Uh, I think he preserved Britain basically, for much longer than it might have been expected. Um, although he probably didn't realise it, and I'm sure the reason he did it to some extent was so he could free a lot of frontier forces um, to, for his own use on the continent and so forth, because uh, he's always accused by some of the contemporary sources of stripping Britain of their troops. Well, probably did, but he actually had a, 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 such a strong settlement that there wasn't really any trouble. You don't read of any trouble except allegedly in the 13, 390s, when um, the Western um, warlord, um, Stilicho, uh, was said to have come to Britain to put down yet another rebellion. And there's a, a long panegyric about how wonderful it was. Uh, and I'm not sure, a lot of scholars don't believe a word of it. Um, you know, he, he, it was just an ex... They had to bolt a few things onto his career to make him sound frightfully grand. But he spent most of his time firefighting, firefighting on the continent with waves of people crossing the Rhine or coming up from the Danube and causing trouble for the Western Empire. So uh, it, it's a somewhat of a difference, I think, really. So Maximus's legacy, then, I suppose, is it, is it different on the continent versus uh, it, here in Britain? Or how is, how is he remembered more broadly, perhaps? Well, on the continent... Uh, it's clear that some of the, the sources that written fifth century chroniclers um, took a fairly fairly uh, uh, favorable view of him, of him. We don't really know how he, he, and you get the view from people like Ambrosius, uh, St. Ambrose, that um, he wasn't a bad chap. And one of the most famous of Western senators, Quintus Aurelius Simicus, uh, went as far as to write a panegyric for him when he was, to, when he came to, Became conquered Italy and became emperor there, um, which if only it had survived, would have solved all our problems. It probably told us a lot of uh, somewhat inflated truths about him. But of course, uh, he had to very quickly um, stick it on the bonfire uh, when uh, Maximus fell and uh, make his peace with um, uh, with Theodosius the first. So we don't. But uh, people like if people as sophisticated as him were busy taking a fairly favourable view and writing to him. Uh, then I think it, the, on the continent, the, the general impression was that he was all right, you know. Uh, and also, I think all, uh, one thing I did exp uh, um, explore slightly was his, uh, he did have a, he almost certainly had two daughters, at least two daughters, which uh, uh, vaguely attested. One had mental health problems and was cured of it by a man called St. Olidius uh, in Trier. And then uh, either the same daughter or another one it almost certainly married um, a very high senior Roman aristocrat uh, and uh, was almost certainly the mother of the Emperor Petronius Maximus, who um, came to power by killing Valentinian III in 455. And if you look at that, it's one grandson of, it's a grandson of Theodosius who killed Max, Magnus Maximus, killing, um, being killed by a grandson of Magnus Maximus. It's almost like, a, was there a, was there a, a, a two gener a three generation grudge being settled at that time. I don't know. It's very strange, but um, a, a modern piece of research 
uh, was published about 10 years ago, suggesting that this was the case. And I must say, I find it very convincing. And of course, it was his, he had a wife who was um, keen. He, they were both very, key, very keen church people. I mean, Magnus Maximus said he went straight from straight from the font to the font to the throne. He was baptized when he was elevated as emperor, and he was very keen on Christianity ever since. And his wife was because she got into conversation with Saint Martin, um, whom she served at table in a very humble way to show how she, much she admired him. Uh, so. Which also proves, of course, that St. Martin thought that my Magnus Maximus was a pretty good egg if he was prepared to go and have supper with him and spend time in Trier with him. So the impression is that he was actually a reasonably good egg. And all said and done. It's, it's funny that he should be well, less famous. Well, I, I suppose it's the time product of the time he lived in more than, yeah, and more his, than anything else. His demise was unfortunate because um in order, it, it, when he invaded Italy, he wanted to spare Valentinian II, who was still only a child, basically, uh, from being murdered. He didn't want to make a mistake that happened when his other adversary, Gratian, was murdered unceremoniously and very, very treacherously. So he set, packed him off with his, with his, what, well, he, he escaped with his mother and sister to the court at Constantinople. And even when they got to Constantinople, Theodosius didn't really want to do anything about it. So I'm absolutely sure that the the, the game plan between Maximus and Theodosius was to replace these two offspring of the Valentinian dynasty uh, with their, a, a dynasty of their own. But uh, unfortunately, um, the mother of Valentinian II, Justina, was a, a scheming woman and um, produced her daughter Galla before Theodosius, who'd just been widowed, and uh, it was instant attraction. Um, Theodosius became completely besotted we're told by Zosimus, who I, I this is often dismissed as a as a as myth but or fantasy, but I think it's totally human. He became so besotted that he changed his mind about whether he was going to dislodge Maximus. Um, he wanted to marry this Gala, and Justina said, "We will marry her. You've got to get rid of Maximus." So in the end, he married her and sent an expeditionary force to get rid of Maximus. And uh, the result was that Maximus's memory was blotted out as fe effectively as possible. So, sad but true. Well, <laughs> we now have some more literature to read up on him. Uh, Maximus, tell, tell us, tell us a, a little bit about your book, if you can. About what? About about your book. The uh, is it, is it out now? It's out on the fifteenth of March, um, three days after my daughter gets married. Who? Uh, I shall be too shell shocked to appreciate it, probably. <laughs> but um, yeah, it's coming out on the fifteenth of March from Amberley, um, twenty-five quid a shot, um, and I hope people read it. I, I, and I've tried to make it. I've tried to base everything I've said on uh, with academic rigor as much as I can summon up. So it's it is footnoted, but at the back, so you don't need to look at the footnote. You can just read what it says and see if you believe it or not. But I've tried to make a convincing case for the chap. And I tried to put it back on the map and tried to explain why why Britain uh, is should be especially grateful to him in, in in their way. So, you know, I, I hope it um, and I hope I, I tried to make it readable, which is one. Of the <laughs> That's what we all try for. I think <laughs> um, this sounds absolutely fascinating. I I love the sound of this. I think it's a really interesting time for Britain as well. So we shall do our best for you. Uh, anyway, I, I, I've enjoyed this conversation and uh, I recommend it to you. Um, Maxwell, thank you ever so much for coming on. It's been a real, real pleasure. Thank you, Andrew. Thank you, Alex. It's been a pleasure. Our incredible guests give us 45 minutes of their time to join us and talk about their work or their new book. This is just a small taster. As a result, we have launched our very own bookshop on bookshop.org, where you can find our guests' latest books, you can support them, and you can support us on History Hack. 10% of every sale via our bookshop supports the podcast and allows us to keep going and bring you more top-of-the-line guests. You can find our bookshop at bookshop.org forward slash shop forward slash history hack, or search for us in the shop section. Thank you so much for your continued support. We really appreciate our listeners and supporters. So make sure you get down to the bookshop and grab yourselves a new book.